zoom zip and I wake up. A zoom zip. A zoom zip and I wake up. A zoom zip. so many people now people <laughs> looking at it. And that is the truth. You know, I thought about it in regards to sometimes you get tired. I thought about it in regards to what is happening. All the years of frustration that goes back to the 80s and all you're asking for is right. Just to do things right. No more, no less. And even that, the response has been not just negative, but been counter 
in regards to making you the bad guy. And if you ask me to explain to understand, I explain that obviously I cannot. I do not understand why that has always been. But now, I don't know how strong the movement is, but I know there is a movement. You have empowered yourself, and that is what has caused the movement, you know, statewide. And some of it they absolutely don't care about or don't know about geothermal. It is how government is doing things uh, that is waking people up. And it is 255 in 97. As you know, 55 is the public lands to develop the corporation in 97 is the elimination of all of the agreements in regards to 96 that govern geothermal, in regards to where, how. And they had the, I call it the nerve to do what they did. What it represented to me is a blatant disregard of respect of laws, respect of people, and what they're supposed to do. I'm going to cut my short because we have a very important speaker today. I want to show you how time is changing. I got this last night, and this is from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. For those of you, that's a very reputable, important part of the government of the state of Hawaii, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. If it weren't for 55, if it weren't for 97, I do not believe that they would have taken such a public issue of support of you and your concerns. It is not direct, but it is direct because of the opposition of 97 and calling for the repeal of 97. So you will bear with me. Again, I just got that just from them last night. In talking to them of why they didn't uh, make testimony on the 106 last week, you know, they had a very good reason for it, for its time, etc. But they promised that they would. That they would make testimony supporting 106, which calls for the repeal of 97, which is horrendous. I cannot believe the mentality of who wrote it. I can't understand such arrogance to do it and thinking they can do any damn thing they want. And let me read you just in parts. So excuse me, bending over. This is dated February for February 11, 8.30 a.m. So you can see this is what's going to be presented on Monday morning. The Office of Foreign Affairs supports 106, which will repeal Act 97 and return vital regulations to the exploration and development of geothermal resources. 106 will reinstate the regulations that were enacted in response to the unique hazards created by geothermal exploration and development and to ensure critical input by the most affected communities. There should be an open and transparent process for evaluation of geothermal exploration or development, particularly for proposals that will impact on white most fragile lands and communities. And you know we're talking about you. Further, since geothermal exploration and development may result in emission of noxious gases and noise and ground surface disturbance, the geothermal resource subzone provisions that were deleted by Act 97 provide an additional layer of protection and procedural safeguards. This includes a public hearing in a proposed affected community and an opportunity for contested case hearing. This is from the Office of Office. And thank you for that, and every opportunity you have, please graciously thank anybody related to the Office of Foreign Affairs for that very, very public support. You know, and I know, that prior to recently, there were very few people outside of you that would even say that in public without being ridiculed. You know that. And look what Act 97 did for you. So I thank authors of that 97 <laughs> and 55 is this is that. In regards to my testimony, testimony was made for one of the second column for the repeal. 
And because we have people that are much smaller and smarter than I am, like Bill Smith there, who submitted testimonies, and other people, many people, including the thousand friends, including Sierra Club, including the Maui uh, administration of County of Maui, including our county government, very nicely. And you can see that because of you, and I am not going to smoke, before you, there was no support, publicly. And what you have to do from here on in is make this grow. You have to make your empowerment that this is your land, this is your lifestyle, this is your country, this is your government. Not just a few who think they have the arrogance that you can do any damn thing you want. Yeah. If you may, I'm going to bend over again. This is sort of a big excerpt of what was read to you on 55 and now 106 of my testimony. In recent weeks of travel to Maui, Molokai, Oahu, and communities in the Hawaii Island, I have experienced a growing feeling of disconnect and distrust of people with their government. Feelings that their government and its decisions are made not for people of this land, not for the care of their land, but rather for special interest groups or for short-term benefits. Along with these feelings of disconnect and the lack of trust is a loss of hope that their concerns, lifestyles, their hardships, and cares of this earth of our any importance. We must all be on guard against actions and behavior that will add to the disconnect and distrust of our government. We may say, we must say stop to those that do. I ask for understanding, excuse me, I ask that we refocus on our responsibilities for social, environmental, cultural, and spiritual care in the stewardship of Hawaii, our home. I ask for understanding that this is not just an issue of geothermal, this is about the relationship between the people and their government. This is of the hope and belief that we all seek, that our government will be fair and do what is right by law in a sense of what is right. This is at the heart of the relationship between people and their government. This is a matter of trust. I ask for your support. <laughs> I will close here, but I need to say thank you and I do mean that. I've worked for your county government since 1971. I've seen all kinds of things that sometimes frustrate you and uh, goes unchecked. You know, because of my job of being there from the 80s in regards to geothermal, geothermal and the natural energy lab. To this day, I cannot, I cannot understand by those of power and those of government who will not come and talk to those that they represent and those that depend on them to do what is right. This went on from the 80s to the 90s and the 2000s. And now you're in the year 2013. And finally, finally, people are beginning to listen. Thank you very much for being there for us. Thank you, you know, for such dedication. It's, I don't know, like to happen. Um, I'm going to bring up uh, another guy that has been um, uh, dealing with the subject for many, 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 many years. Uh, he's kind of like the Bill Mayor of uh, Puma. Like, uh, I don't know, I'm this. Like, you know, so anyway, he's been dealing specifically with the geothermal issue for a long time. I'd like to bring up Bob Patrice. Aloha. Aloha. I want to thank you all for coming again and uh, for all of these. Uh, I see somebody with their hand up. I'm going to 
from NCO also. Will the person with a black Ford Ranger please turn your lights off? <laughs> so, um, boy, I, I gotta tell you guys, we've really come a long ways. We got the county council to uh, to pass a support repeal of 97, and that included the mayor. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then and then we went to the legislature with Harry Kim and uh, everybody told us, no way, no more chance. Are you no chance? And we just got 97 repeal passed through the, through the first committee over there. We're looking good in the second So uh, you know, really you guys get a lot you guys get the credit because we can't do it. Uh, without the support that we've been getting at, at the county council meetings, we get 80 people signing up to testify, we get 100 testimonies for these bills. So keep it up. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we, we've traveled around a lot, and so we've moved this issue out of Puna now. We've made connections on all of the different islands, and Harry Kim gets a lot of credit for that because he bridged a lot of gaps for us, and he brought a lot of credibility to what we were talking about. But now we're working with Sierra Club, a thousand friends, Ayaloha Molokai, who Ayaloha Molokai just shut down the big wind project on Molokai. Yeah. And they, they, I just talked to them last night and they're 100% on board with us. They're going to turn their energies to helping us now. Okay, so, you know, we've been trying to get a house study here for. 30 years, a long, long time. And we had a proposal put forward to the county council for a house study, uh, and they turned us down. They created this working group. Anyway, the, the uh, doctor that we, we did a lot of research before we put that proposal out, the doctor that we found that we thought was a leading expert on toxicity in the United States, Dr. Kay Kilborn, has flown here today uh, to, to help us. Us. And he's going to meet with us with Dr. Kilburn tomorrow, I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Adler's group tomorrow. So I want to tell you a little bit about, about Dr. Kilburn. Um, he is, uh, like I said, probably the leading toxicologist in the United States. He is from Utah. He went to, uh, to school at the University of, uh, of Utah. He actually worked with Dr. Legator and Dr. Janet Sherman who was here in the, in the earlier part during the blowout and did the, the original health survey, so he's familiar with that. He's treated employees from the PGB plant that came to California to seek treatment from him. And uh, he's going to talk about that. And uh, let's see. So after uh, university, um, Well, I'm just going to say, he's done so much. He was uh, the director at the university. Um, he's been to England. He uh, was a director for research, heart research for the Army. And I, I can't read off the paper, so I just can't do that. But the, the list would take a half an hour. Uh, there's nobody more qualified than I've been able to find. So um, we're very honored to have him here. and. Uh, Aloha, thank you. It's always a great pleasure to be with a group of people who are trying to help themselves. And uh, I have learned a lot out your situation. I thought I knew something about it before I came but the last two days. I've been learning breakneck speed. And what I want to share with you, obviously I can put together as a PowerPoint overnight. I'm not quite capable of that. But I want to share with you that you're not alone. Across North America, from northern Alberta, Fort Mackay, 
to Louisiana and the blowout of the well in the Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon well, where we think maybe 10 million people, not 10,000, not 100,000, not a million, but 10 million people may have been helped damaged by the spill at the offshore of Venice, Little Venice, a town of about 650 people in uh, South Louisiana, south of uh, New Orleans. I've been down there, I've talked with those people, I've measured impairment of their balance, of their reaction time, of their color vision, and I have compared them with people who have not been exposed, and unfortunately, there's a world of difference. The worst situation that I encountered before I went to the Gulf was at Lovington, New Mexico. What an ironic name, Lovington. Where there are four sources of hydrogen sulfide. The smelly gas, you know it as rock name gas. It's the gas that emanates from the uncollected Easter egg when you break it open. The sulfur in the egg is reacting with hydrogen, making hydrogen sulfide. It happens underground, it happens in volcanoes, it happens in CAFOs. The uh, animal feeding and care facilities that uh, are enclosed in buildings because the profit is better if they enclose them, feed a few antibiotics and so forth. What I'm trying to get across is that it's a single gas, a gas that is in our own nervous systems as a transmitter of impulse but you raise the dose a thousand times and it becomes one of the most potent killers of nerve cells. So having your nerve cells killed, what happens? Your brain doesn't work very well. It slows down. You don't balance well, you don't see well. And of course, what will be said by Dr. Thomas or Dr. Adler, uh, it's all age. Well, it's all age, but who wants to age at five or ten times as fast as everybody else? You know, the nervous system doesn't have that many ways of reacting. So, with that sort of as a preamble, we're talking about a very small molecule. The yellow is the sulfur, the two hydrogens, hydrogen sulfide and it's a, a deadly gas. First known to be deadly about 1700. The privy cleaners in Italy. Uh, everybody know what a privy is? Yeah. If you fill it up, you gotta clean it. And the privy cleaners would go down and they'd come back with blurry eyes and coughing and irritated lungs, and some of them would die. And in his brilliance, a 1700 year, uh, 1700 AD physician recognized something was in privy gas that was obnoxious enough to extremely disturb the function. Quick forward to 1776. You all know what was happening in 1776 in this country. We uh, had a revolution. We had a declaration of independence. We began to approach self-government, which we've still not been able to really conquer. But, uh, we approached. And it was Jefferson, and it was Madison, and Hamilton, and Washington. And the great doctor of all, no degree, 
Who am I thinking of? The smartest man. Franklin is right. The man who one day was describing lead poisoning from personal experience. The first description in America of poisoning from industrial work was lead poisoning in printers. And Franklin is my inspiration above all the others because he's my predecessor in making recognition of terrible problems. Next slide. Just before I went to British Columbia and Alberta, they had a chemical blowout. Of course, these things don't happen, as you know. Uh, but this one happened at St. John's. I was headed to St. John's, and uh, we were able to get the picture off uh, the internet or off, you know, transmission from TV show snow on the ground and St. John's had a mushroom cloud that wasn't nuclear. Next. It was good timing because of it. So what we're talking about here is that uh, it isn't just big doses that kill in Maine. Little doses build up, nervous cells get hit, some die, some just don't function well. And that is the problem. So when they say, well, you haven't exceeded 10 parts per million, which under the right conditions is lethal, or you haven't exceeded 50 parts per million, or 200 parts per million, I can point to reports and to work that fits a different curve says almost always a brief exposure to 200 parts per million of H2S or equivalent reduced sulfur gases is fatal. But smaller doses increment. The first study we did in San Luis Obispo, California, a little town called Nipoma, we found at levels between one and five parts per million we had severe impairments that in the population of about 60 people we could recognize. And the ironic thing was 12 of those were workers. We couldn't distinguish the workers any worse off than the people who were the downwind neighbors of the plant. Uh, it was obvious that chain link fence wasn't very effective in keeping nitrogen sulfide. <laughs> Next, please. Well, here are some of the sources. This is a explosion in Alberta. It was I've forgotten the name of it now, but here is a familiar volcanic picture. It could have been on Hawaii. And here's a massive feedlot where the feces are generating hydrogen sulfide, particularly when they go into uh, holding ponds. So if you have water to provide hydrogen, and you have a source of sulfur to provide sulfur, you can make hydrogen sulfide. You can oxidize it to make sulfur dioxide. And this is what uh, the problem was across Europe from North America from coal burning without taking the sulfur out of the coal. This uh, really almost made an international incident. Sweden, the most uh, pacific and uh, least uh, kind of uh, bold and instrumental in you know, going after uh, perpetrators. Uh, called on the United States government and said, can't you regulate so our pine trees don't all die in sweet? And they were dying from a leaf rot that was directly due to sulfur dioxide. Next. Well, I'm not going to labor on these. This is Alberta. Alberta is where Banff Park is. It has the Calgary Stampede, the greatest rodeo on earth. Anybody like rodeos? Anybody ride broad wild bulls? <laughs> Hope not. 
of the people who ran a family that were noted in Calgary for their rodeo prowess. One half the family of six got exposed to sulfur as hydrogen sulfide when they had a brief emission from one of the desulfurization collecting points going to a desulfurization point. This is the Thurston family, who are friends of mine, and the two boys who were outstanding athletes and scholars became unable to stay in school. One boy was called behaviorally altered, but it was really the fact his asthma was so severe and improperly treated and literally untreated that he couldn't stay in school. And his uh, two-year-older brother was also a drop from the leader of his class to almost the block. The Thurston's daughter and the oldest son not exposed and the husband, not exposed, sort of served as the unexposed compared to mother, uh, Linda and uh, Jeff and Robert. So that's the story of sort of Great Valley, which is north of Calgary and quite far west of Calgary. Next. <clears throat> and this just shows Calgary. And the only other place I'm going to talk about is far to the north, just off the map, is Fort Mackay. Fort Mackay is famous. It isn't Fort Mackay. It's spelled like my name, but it's uh, Mackay. Uh, they are turning over the Ucalic forest to mine by Tumen. They call it tar sand. It's sand all right, but it's sand and bitumen that is so sticky and so nasty that they have to superheat water to melt enough to get the squeezings out, as I call them, to make a little bit of gasoline. This is the great new source of gasoline for North America and the world, is this bitumen. And it's a colossal operation. It's the smelliest place on earth. And the native people, the First Nation people, are utterly, practically wiped out by this. The doctor who first talked about the unusual cancers, as it's cancer causing, was uh, forced to go to Nova Scotia Medical Board of Canada decided he was rapidized browsing and inflaming the people. The word was inflaming the people. So John O'Connor was forced to go to uh, Nova Scotia. But being an Irishman, he only stayed down for a while, like nine months, and he said, those people still need me. So he went back and the government said that there's no one else can do John's job. So they welcomed him, made him the chief of public health, the chief of practice in the hospital, and the clinic for the First Nation people. If you want to keep a good man down, give him three jobs to do. <laughs> Isn't that clever? Uh, I know John well, and I know his uh, wife, who is the only real influence over John. She's one of the best nurses in the country, and uh, she keeps it scheduled to make sure that patient John, with all his talents, gets kind of spread around enough to get the job done. There's a great story there, and there isn't time to tell. But remember that Albert Schweitzer has his North American equal. Remember, he's the doctor that went into Africa and got a Nobel Prize, carrying medicine to people who didn't have any at all. Well, John O'Connor in Alberta, for my money, gets the Schweitzer Prize. Next. Here is a farm to various species. Cattle, horses, birds, and 
of course, you know, we kind of lose sight of humans sometimes and our desire to uh, make things easier for the uh, other animals. But <clears throat> hydrogen sulfide can poison all these species. In fact, it's a poison to single cells. It poisons brains of mice and rats that we use, our laboratory animals. So it just has no limit to where it can do damage. It will throw the TV set and uh, make it inoperative. So it, uh, or a microwave, microwaves last about six months in these heavily uh, exposed areas. And, and you know, you just trade them in before the warranty and get them replaced. But what do you do with your brain? That's the thing. Next. <clears throat> well, we've got that apparatus on the nose, in front of our face, which uh, detects hydrogen sulfide at about 30 parts per billion, billion with B. Not million, but billion. And this apparatus in front of our face is meant to protect us. At 30 parts per billion, you should leave the area. Because if you stay there, the nose gives up. It chickens out. Not because it wants to, but because it burns its nerves out so it can't send signals. You know, it's like taking a blowtorch to an electrical line. You can't stop the power if you break the line. So that's a, a lesson I think everyone should take. This is a gas that gives you a chance but you should run, and does everybody know the direction to run? Again? Away, but away where? Downhill or uphill? Why? It's denser than air. The gas is denser than air. So it collects downhill, so if you want to get away, you run up. Everybody must remember that and test you on it before I'm through. <laughs> Next. Well, here is Los Angeles, which town I'm not particularly fond of, but it's next to Pasadena and we have to tolerate it. That's what it looked like in 1940. See the oil derricks? It was a huge oil producing uh, city. And over to the right is pond where they were excavating to put the Belmont Learning Center or school, a high school dedicated for the education of the Hispanic population. Now, you know, Hispanics are not very popular uh, until, well, the Republicans don't even admit they exist. <laughs> the last election proved that, that they may have to be a political force to be reckoned with. I believe they're now a plurality, not a majority, a plurality in California. They're more Hispanics than any other group. So, uh, how do they get on Hispanics? Well, this high school was dedicated to their education. It was built on a place where a friend of mine, a beautiful and talented actress who's an activist, took a bottle and you saw the pond in the previous slide. She inverted the mason jar full of water, collected the gas, it was analyzed, 350 parts per million hydrogen sulfide. It was coming through frack holes, old drill holes. We got a lot of earthquakes. We don't have volcanoes in, in California, luckily, but we have lots of earthquakes. That fracks the ground just like hydraulic fracking to get oil and gas out. And in those crevices, gas came up to the surface. And Patricia was able to collect it not once, but three times, and measured it each time. It was about 350 parts per minute. Uh, roughly twice the amount you need to be killed. And that's where we put a school. When I went to the hearings about this, I suggested the Board of Education 
that if they were convinced it wasn't dangerous, they should move their office to a new school. And we could let the kids go to the office building for their chance at education. So the school open? Huh. Yeah, right. Let's go on. The school got built, it's been open. Hearings went this way and that way. Finally, they decided they just rename it, leave it on the same site. And I'm just waiting till the first collection of casualties comes in from the Belmont school site. Symptoms. Are there symptoms for exposure to hydrogen sulfur? Silence. What do you complain of if you get exposed? Yeah, nausea and vomiting. And, uh, yeah. My irritation. My irritation. Yeah, what's the worst thing that happens? Exactly. You die. You get foggy. Dying is very cheap and easy, and you don't have regrets. So, you know, that's the easy way out. Have your brain knocked at a skelter is uh, you have to live with that. So, uh, well, suffice it to say there are lots of symptoms and uh, they don't really tell you much except you've had exposure. They don't tell you how bad your impairment is for balance or vision, no reaction time, or seeing colors, but so on. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, here's just another part of the list. We'll go on from this. You know it well. Where does it hit the brain? Well, I show this picture just to remind everybody what a human brain looks like. Uncovered. And the skull is no protection. You know, we think of, gosh, we got this skull and that protects us from all the bad things that are about to happen. The National Football League is recently learned. It's after Super Bowl, so we can talk about the National Football League. That the people who have been using their heads as battering rams and suffering, what do they suffer from? Concussion. They get demented. And who went to bat for these poor men? I don't think there are any women who lost their brains from concussion in the National Football League. But, just at home. but their wives couldn't live with them. It was really difficult. So they got together, banded themselves into a pretty powerful group of people, and they called on the President and the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, <coughs> and a couple, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of other important people in Washington, and now, you know, this problem of concussion is almost as important as uh, gun control or abortion or, you know, contraception, all of which are you know, non-Republican issues. But it's the whole brain gets hit. That's what this slide is here. Forgive me for ranting. Here is the cerebellum, where you make the decisions about health, the visual and the occipital lobe, where 40% of the brain is taking visual signals and trying to interpret them, so the rest of the brain can be activated. And uh, our motion, here we have a line in the picture, sort of the middle of the brain, where we have impulses coming in and make decisions. Or things like correcting balance. If you sway too far, what has to happen? You got to sway back. You're kind of like a pole. If you're going to stay upright, you can either go all the way over or you can come back. And so you sway, and that's what we can measure. And that's what this apparatus is meant to do. It's an apparatus that has a detector of sound. You put a cap on, and the 
this looks like inside of the welding helmet. That's exactly what it is. It has a screw at the back. You put it on the head like this. It emits sound when you push the button, and the sound is recorded like this. Now, this is a little too high for me because I had Bill Smith in position. He's a few inches taller than I am. But we line up in the plane, and then we can trace the path with a computer and measure how much sway people have. And we know from studying unexposed people of all ages and sizes, from seven-year-old kids, 85-year-old grandparents, that uh, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, those little kids, that uh, balance is age related, you get more and more sway, faster and faster sway. But you can produce calculations that allow you to say this is normal or abnormal for this person. We're not talking about a batch of people and averages, we're talking about in all the testing you do, you're compared to yourself. What are the important things to consider. One is age. Everyone would agree we kind of fall apart as we get older. We start at about 17. Some people think 25. But nevertheless, you come up gaining possibilities and uh, capabilities till about 17. You may plateau to about 25 and then you fall off. So these calculations take into effect that curve for everyone. What's another factor that would come into account? LFD. Less <laughs> uh, Timothy Leary. Yeah. Uh, well, how about uh, gender? Or do you call it sex and why? Women are better at all these things than men. Sorry, fellas, we just have to admit that what we thought was happening is true. Uh, so gender, age, gender, how about number of years in school? As an estimate of original brain capability, that's the other factor. And then we got height and length. So five factors for all these tests not five in each test, but selected out by careful statistical mathematics. So we establish for each person. And I know this can't be seen, but I'll put a little light on it. <laughs> Paradox of, this is a list of the testing that's done. It's a rather full page. Has three columns. One, the, the numbers generated by you, the numbers predicted for you. Do you exceed a margin, a 5% confidence interval around the prediction? And then we let the computer decide what's abnormal and add up the abnormality. So each person who is tested ends up with one sheet of paper with all the numbers of all their tests summarized. Now we wouldn't make this just to print out, but it then goes into the computer file and we can look at 20 people or 30 people. We can look at factors like nearness to exposure, numbers of time knocked down, and you know, any other things time under anesthesia, numbers of alcoholic drops. I'm not sure that doesn't happen in Hawaii. <laughs> no alcohol. And uh, even smoking, years of smoking. We also measure pulmonary function. Because how do things get to the brain? Anyone? The air. How do you take from air into the brain? Well, not the lung. Remember the lung? The powerful bellows? 
We use this in the whistles when we do uh, have asthma. So the lung is the entry through the nose, and it's also a place where we can begin to intervene by giving medications through the nose. Okay, let's go on. I've already mentioned the brain is important for vision. If you take the 40% for vision, 30% for balance, about 70% of the brain is left for all the incidental things we do. Now that would seem like an awful disproportion, but you know we're talking about an organism, an organ really, with uh, literally billions of neurons. So it has a huge capacity, and fortunately, it's been that capacity being replaced. The replacement is from stem cells. Anybody heard of stem cells? Big debates about whether we should have stem cell research. You can only do it if you're a Democrat and they're in the blue state. <laughs> so it's limited. Uh, old white men in the South can't do stem cell research. Because they need legal. But if you're in Jerry Brown State, we are the leaders in stem cell research. The brain makes stem cells in the third ventricle, one of those places where in the brain, if you can see air, third ventricle cells migrate and they get into the Roland fissure, which we showed before, or they get into the cerebellum or the temporal lobe and they replace the six cells. Or they replace the dying cells just from wearing out, oxygen environment. So stem cells are the way we have the capacity to lay down new memories. Unfortunately, hydrogen sulfide is a killer of stem cells. So you're left in the situation where if you inhale hydrogen sulfide now and then, you are caught with not enough stem cells to lay down new memories. So your recent memory doesn't work. You can't recognize the faces of people that you just met yesterday or remember their telephone numbers or sometimes go down to the store and try to remember what it was you came for, what store you should go in. And even worse, get through with your non-profitable trip and say, now, where's home? How do I get back? Patients of mine honestly have had all of these problems. That's the epitome of being memoryless and brain fog. Okay, let's take the next one. Poisoning can occur uh, and if it's really severe, it can be lethal or can be damaging. And uh, you can have breathing stop, actually. And then they say, oh, you died of hypoxia. Well, yeah, it's easy to die of hypoxia if you've got a hole in your head from the bullet. Or a hole in your neurons. Now, uh, how did I come on this slide? I put these together two years ago to Alberta, and lo and behold, Pune Geothermal Plant Hawaii. Familiar? Anybody know where it is? <laughs> what the fuck should we do about it? That's why we're here. I think it's just so ironic that I'm here talking with you about my experience with hydrogen sulfide and what should be done. And one of my examples, two years ago, was collected and put in a PowerPoint, and it was put in Hawaii. The next one is a tribute to uh, Bob Katusi. Anyone remember this sign? Was yeah. That on yeah. Bob, did you confess to making that sign? Where is it? Okay, so 
Dr. We do have a problem here. <laughs> we have problems in Texas. You know, Texas has a little bit of everything. They've uh, got drought, and they've got uh, Houston, which is where the squeezings of the, sh the oil in uh, Tumen and Fort Mackay, they end up in Houston, they converted to gasoline. And uh, they've got a long history of contributing to studying school children or the effects of air pollution. A study that I did with a friend of mine some 25 years ago. So Texas counts, and Texas has these great basins. But right here, uh, this area called Smackover, I was called upon by two women. Women are always the caller twos, who were afraid their children would be damaged by the biggest desulfurization plant in the world. It's Smackover. And they built the plant 500 yards oh my God. from an elementary school with 750 students and 150 faculty and staff. And they said, what do you think, Dr. Kilburn? And I said, unfortunately, the fact they're going to give you warning, how many school buses do you have? How fast can they be loaded? How many will actually get out of the premises in two minutes? <laughs> maybe one bus, maybe two buses, if all goes well. And I said, how many children do you really want to save? But the settlement arranged for by the Texas Energy Board, which is called Texas Railroad, um, that's kind of an interesting name, but the same agency that first used to you know, regulate railroads, this sounded all like a what? Um, is the board that decides about the safety of desulfurization plants for fuel. Now, you know, there's possible there's somebody on that energy board who knows what hydrogen sulfide is, but uh, beyond that, I doubt that there's much likely to happen. Um, uh, the energy board's regulation, so far as I know, nothing has. Thanks. Well, let's get out of Texas. It's, uh, Anybody recognize the symbol at the bottom? Yeah. Shell oil. The big companies that are making us really take it on the chin are the big energy companies that we used to call oil companies, international cartel, and which is the top money maker in the international cartel. Anyone know? Exxon. What are they most famous for in North America? The Exxon Valdez disaster, and number two being the most profitable company in the world. Not just North America, in the world. Number two company, Shell Oil. They wanted to drill off the uh, west coast of Alaska. <laughs> They've not been able to get the drill rig to float up to position because of the extremely severe snowstorms and bad weather and so on. And, you know, I don't really believe that God can intervene in these things, but there is a possibility that uh, all the bad luck for Shell is uh, bad luck that has uh, maybe been uh, organized or requested. Next. This is a watch pole blowout. This is in Alberta. And there are approximately 7,000 people who were at watch pole that have never been formally studied. I've talked with some of them. This was what could happen at a geothermal facility. But it was actually just a drilling facility. There was a tremendous upthrust of gas 
it uh, wrecked the rig, it took down the uh, pressure reducing valves and so on. And so uh, people in about a 10 mile radius got the benefits of the smack over. All the benefits, as far as I can tell, of impairments of their function. Thanks. So, this is a uh, situation that is unexpected or different. And, you know, we can talk about other disasters. Um, certainly, Bhopal is one, uh, Chernobyl is another, and the radiation leak at Three Mile Island. But what's eclipsed all those, except Chernobyl, is the radiation disaster fairly recent. Fukushima, Japan, yeah, they've got a real one. And they have been so inept at studying it, we don't know how serious it is. If we put Hiroshima and 200 people immediately dead and a million dying from radiation disease at one end and Three Mile Island at the other, uh, certainly uh, Fukushima is nearer Hiroshima in its effect than it is to, uh, to Three Mile Island, which luckily was contained. And, uh, as Dr. Sherman, you heard the name Janet Sherman, she's an expert on what happened at Three Mile Island. It's like coming to Hawaii years ago, she went and studied the people at Three Mile Island. Okay, next. The brain measurements we make are shown on this slide. It matches what uh, I held up as the uh, summary for a single patient, but on the left side of the group bar, uh, or the slide, are the uh, physiological measurements. Now, these are the things the brain does for us so quickly that it would be quicker than we can think and do. Balance, vision, these things are fast. When they slow down, we know it. We may not attribute it to anything, but that ugly word, aging, is the one. On the right hand side are the more mental type of tests, the things psychologists are known to do. And there are some of those that are very good for defining how your long term memory is, how your perceptual motor speed is for doing such things as putting pegs in a peg board or making trails from uh, 1 through uh, 25 on a sheet of paper. Tests that have been around a long time, we know they work. We have the way with the equations to calculate what they mean, what their variance is. So, uh, we use <coughs> Now here is a subject doing reaction time. This is the test set up to my left here. You have a keyboard that we bring up on the screen, which you can see on the computer. A big A or a big S, and they have to be canceled. And the time to cancellation is the reaction time. If we use all A's, it would be simple reaction time, A and S. Choice reaction. Next. Balance, which is one I was demonstrating a bit here. Bill Smith uh, helped me set up this morning. But you're essentially picking up from a probe that emits sound the pattern that the head makes is representing the front. And sway speed can be calculated from that. Next. And here is doing a visual test, visual fields, which probably many of you have been.
any of your optometrists or your ophthalmologists that have visual fields done. Show of hands, how many know what I'm talking about? Well, this test can be used for testing response to poisons like H2S. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Here's an ordinary test available in an ophthalmologist's office that we have standardized and can use. This good looking child in the demonstration is a granddaughter. Like uh, all grandparents, I'm super proud of her. Next. Doing the test I just talked about, putting pegs in a peg board. Okay. Measuring hydrogen sulfide. There are two good and handy portable ways of doing it. Greater tubes and uh, your own meter. I won't talk much about these. They're both very good ways to see whether what industry tells us about concentrations in the air are within a country mile of what they really are. Sometimes closer, sometimes further away. Next. And here is, uh, I talked about doing breathing tests, blowing out through this device and measuring how well the lung, how big it is and how well get air out of it, respiratory flow. Next. And here is the color test, taking the discs, this so that you're in this cute little box. And you simply take the discs out and return them to their position under much more light than we have in this auditorium. But, uh, under good lighting, people with intact color vision do a perfect job. People exposed to hydrogen sulfide almost invariably fail color vision. So of the objective tests, totally objective, balance, reaction time, color vision are the most discriminatory. The fourth one actually is grip strength. How powerful is your grip? This is where the men out do the women, but putting that aside, it's a good test. Fatigue muscles are operating under stress at their synapses, stress at their muscle fiber shortening, and uh, they don't function well. Next. Here is a uh, picture of the shipyard area of Los Angeles, we had a Texaco refinery. Anybody remember when we had Texaco? <laughs> yeah, this one was 1992. Now I think Texaco is part of Mobile, but got absorbed into, I think they went into Shell. Now there are only four old companies of any size. We had a huge spill here. A plant uh, had an explosion. It was thought to be an earthquake. But checking with the seismologists at Caltech and Pasadena, it wasn't. It was just a single spike. Earthquakes, as you know, rumble and go and then rumble again and have aftershocks. It wasn't. It was an explosion in the uh, desulfurization plant in Texaco. The uh, man guards at the gate wouldn't let the fire department do it. Long Beach or Wilmington in. So they fight the fire on their own. Um, about uh, four hours later, they admitted the firemen in. They were completely out of control. But meanwhile, in the harbor, 20 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide, 12 miles away in West Wilmington, uh, 24 parts per million. That's where a school is that so I'll come back and talk about. And uh, it was a total disaster. Uh, how many people? Uh, low estimate 20,000, high estimate 80,000. I mean, this is all for having an oil refinery of the sulfurization plant. 
in the middle of the second largest harbor in North America. I mean, Long Beach and Los Angeles are the number one and two as harbors in handling uh, freight. And uh, these people uh, all got poisoned. Uh, I won't tell the long story, it is complicated, it is interesting. Bottom line, we finally studied about 50 people selected from this by the court. You know, it's amazing what courts can do. They order science to behave. Uh, I guess it's like God ordering science to behave, but uh, we nevertheless did the study and found that huge degree of impairment in these people. And it had nothing, no correlation whatever with how symptomatic they were. And that was a shock. But when we thought about it, objectivity and how you feel about things are different. And we have to guard against drawing conclusions from absence of symptoms, which is rare, a few symptoms or many symptoms, they're not good protectors. They're protectors is not the right word. Uh, they're not good projectors or predictors of what happens. They're better in women than men because men have another quality we all know about. Denial. <laughs> Any men who don't have denial? Uh, Okay, enough of that. Let's go on to Wellington. Here, uh, my favorite town in New Mexico, Lovington. I've already said a bit about Lovington. Again, uh, women whose husbands worked for the sewer company uh, called me, came to see me, brought their husbands by the year. And the men didn't know what was going on. The women turned out to be more severely affected than the men, which was a surprise. We had eight couples, and from that concluded that Lovington needed a study. I went down to look at it, along with Dr. Jack Thrasher, a New Mexico uh, toxicologist, and we found four sources. Navajo oils desulfurization plant, Navajo oil is refinery, a cheese factory making cheese and pouring milk that wouldn't meet the criteria being too sour to start, poured it out in an open lagoon across from the public park of Wilmington, a town of 10,000 people, and uh, you know, finally the sewer. Now, the sewer was trying to cope with the grease from the oil refinery and the fat from the milk. How do you think the aerators work in the sewage treatment plant with grease and oil from uh, the refinery? They had to be cleaned continuously, and that's why the sewer uh, got a lot of effect. The women, however, just living in the town were more affected than the men. A paradox I still haven't satisfactorily explained. It's a real illustration. In particular, the interested in children. Actually, this is just a summary showing the eight people, four couples. We studied them and then came back to them about a year and maybe 14 months later. And they were worse. They were not out of exposure. And we were able to show not only were they worse, but the worsening was statistically significant. I mean, it wasn't just a trend. Every test showed statistical significance. And that's an awful, but it's important getting in data. Next. Uh, here's Paul in Ohio. We went to study the effect of the confined animal feeding operations. Probably none of these exist on Hawaii, but they're common in the continental states. Every big city has its pork um, kind of reservoir or uh, watershed. It's hard to call it a pork shed, but I guess a, a capo is a pork shed. Where do they raise the pork for the city? 
And you know how they raise the pork these days? Not like down in Hawaii where pigs sort of run wild and feed. They sit to stand in a station when they're piglets and they have their nose at a feeding worm, worm feed, and feces fall, and water comes through occasionally and washes the feces into a pond where it generates uh, I mean, sulfur. If the power fails, everybody dies inside, including workers, because hydrogen sulfide, not washed out and into the pond, generates such high levels. Well, suffice it to say, a school principal brought his family. We uh, found uh, abnormalities in them. They went back and recruited uh, members of their sort of extended family and friends. And then we found that there were also cat feedlots. So these people were getting cat feedlots. You remember the picture of the Wolstein's being fed and the pigs. And it gave them uh, significant enough uh, impairment that we wrote a paper about it. Uh, so it, uh, again, sourced from animal uh, people with that material. Next. And uh, this shows the way these pigs look. I hope that's visible. Uh, they don't have much uh, standing room. They're standing room only that they can not lie down. So they feed kind of like, um, you know, they uh, run uh, food down a funnel into uh, a box. Only uh, they're making pork out of it, so their, their contribution is convert grain into pork. This is why we have cheap bacon and cheap ham, because the uh, pigs are sacrificed. That's what Next. <laughs> These are some of the ways that studies have been made of brief human exposure to hydrogen sulfide. And these studies get quoted by the people defending hydrogen sulfide as showing there's no effect. Let me point out the defects in these studies. One, they're on healthy human volunteers. Not ordinary people. Two, they last for an hour. Not a day, not a week, not a month, an hour. And three, they only measure what's happening to the lung and heart. They ignore what's happening to the brain. So how much can you take from negative studies to look at the wrong organ so briefly and you know, what are the concentrations, the highest concentration? is five parts per million per hour. So, you know, it's really a trivial kind of study. Next. Uh, notice the pond there, that's at a Dakota City, Nebraska, where um, there is a huge spice industry. Hide, uh, de-skinning, uh, de -hairing. and to dehair uh, animal hides, you salt them with sodium sulfite, source of more sulfur than the manure and so on. And then you uh, agitate them and pull the hair out, and then you know, preserve the hide. Well, you put the water, which nobody wants to use, on these holding ponds that are about two football fields in length, and one football field in width. There are three of them in this little city of less than a thousand people called Dakota City. Right at the crook of the Missouri River where uh, Sioux City, South Dakota is north and Sioux City, Iowa is east. This is Dakota City, uh, Nebraska. Okay, next. So we're winding down. They were unwilling in Dakota City to uh, as Tyson or Iowa meat products or premises to do anything about the problem. So Deborah Ryer, an attorney for uh, the Justice Department, asked the CDC. 
Center for Disease Control to do a study. And they came in and said, well, they'd be glad to, but it would be about 18 months to get results. Because they had to organize the study and recruit the people and be sure they had no biases and that they were doing the right measurements. So Deborah called me and said, Dr. Kilburn, I've read your papers. Could you come and help us? We think that if we can show that these are damaging, these uh, ponds are damaging people in the vicinity, that we can close down uh, the ponds by making Iowa beef products respond to the citation from EPA. So I went, we did, we found the situation and it was worse than we expected because there was a gradient. People closest to the ponds were the most impaired. So we turned the information over to uh, the Justice Department. They then paneled a review board and uh, Dr. Tom Miley, who uh, has been asked to comment on your problem, was a member of the review board. There were several others. I won't belabor this. But the review board finally made all their objections. I responded to the objections. And uh, it was an accepted study. Two days after it went to Iowa Beef Products, they uh, closed the ponds, put covers on them, monitored the hydrogen sulfide, stopped the leaks in the ponds from going into the Missouri River. And I thought the capital thing they did is build a new copper sheathed building not very far from the ponds. And that's where management had their offices. And when the citation was made, management didn't wiggle. But when the study I did came in, they moved immediately 20 miles north in the south. So, you know, they both voted with their feet, I think is the way to call it. Next. Well, I won't be labored further. These are just the way to lay out the ponds in the Missouri River. I show it simply to uh, point out that some of these problems are pretty uh, complex. And they're made more complex than they are by putting in things possibility that, you know, sewer plant for the city was contributing hydrogen sulfide, and uh, that the curve in the river actually was uh, pulling off hydrogen sulfide upstream. I didn't say where, we couldn't find where, but uh, all the objections were met, and they, as I said, voted for Okay, let's go on to the next one. Children. I just show this to emphasize one thing. Is I haven't had the opportunity to do a study just of children for cell phone. But I've managed to collect 20 from bits and pieces of study. And I know that's a kind of dangerous ground, and unless you have a big effect, you're better not to uh, try to deduce anything. But all I point out is that the 20 children from five different places in the country all, as a group, show diminished function, neurological impairment from hydrogen sulfide. Now, as I regard children as our future. I think they deserve a lot of priority. Uh, old duffers like me don't deserve much priority. Well, we like some because we like to extend our lifespans as long as we can. But uh, looking after children, uh, you know, has uh, not been done very well in Newtown, Connecticut, or at uh, all by, but uh, we could do better. I'm sure. Yes. Well, this is 
send you back to Creighton uh, Valley. The Thurston family did stimulate me to ask a question as I did kind of a lecture tour of Alberta. And this is my last point, so those who are hoping I'll sit down and shut up, and soon get back. I had seen a family from Alberta. The um, father brought his daughter and son and wife and said, you know, since they put this big desulfurization plant in, my family's sick and I want to know if it's from sulfur. And I explained to him it was probably hydrogen sulfide. Check the family. I had this 11-year-old girl who was bigger than her counterparts, even bigger than her brother who was two years old. And she had grown up in utero. <coughs> the mother was pregnant, beginning just after this plant began to be sulfurized. So during her whole pregnancy, and then up to age 11, she had exposure. She turned out to be a great person in size, but a diminutive person in brain power, and uh, just pathetic. And I said, I wonder if this is coincidence of some sort, or is this hydrogen sulfur? So with that preamble, every time I address an audience, I would say, if people have a child who they think might be damaged by hydrogen sulfur. I would like to have your name and phone number and so on, and I would be prepared to meet with you in the back of the room. I collected five families. That surprised me a little bit, and I talked with these people, and it was the same thing. One place or another, desulfurization, collecting hydrogen sulfide, or breakdown of piping, or breakdown of uh, other parts of the sort of well head to a finished product had occurred. Now, I can't prove anything with that, and wouldn't want to do so, but it raised my suspicion that uh, as well as children, fetus is in utero, and this fetus is not pita, uh, are very susceptible, maybe the most susceptible of all types of human. And uh, this could be investigated right here because we have the length of life, we have the opportunity to look at pregnancy outcome, um, it could make a really extremely valuable contribution to our understanding. If the suspicion from Alberta were confirmed to Hawaii, here at Poon. Well, thank you very much for listening. I would be happy to uh, try and answer your questions, but it's been a delight to uh, get acquainted. All right. To, to what extent? Can you stand up, please? Okay. To what extent is the sulfur dioxide from volcanoes converting into hydrogen sulfide? In a wet atmosphere, there's no wet, of course, on the way. Uh, water is available. Sulfur dioxide can be um, reduced, we call it chemical, reduced to hydrogen sulfide. So sulfur dioxide can become a source of hydrogen sulfide. To, to what extent chemically would that, would that be the case? Would it be a large extent or much smaller? Or? Well, every situation would have to be studied to define it more finely than I have grossly. Um, the conditions basically uh, need to be 
that um, particularly in the uh, dark, this will happen because it's not a photo-dependent electron transfer process. And uh, there have been relatively few studies. There is a young scientist at uh, University of Santa Barbara who I'm acquainted with um, and who would be delighted to come and try to put together here on uh, Hawaii, uh, around Puna, uh, these conditions. He's an expert, has all the chromatographic equipment, he has the quick response meters, and this needs dynamic study. I'm afraid it's quite expensive to do, uh, and I wouldn't make it a top priority for the first or second round, but I'd make it a very strong priority for about the third round of things that ought to be done. Yes? Steve, you just went to the PowerPoint really fast where it was showing what can we do and how can we protect ourselves. If you can maybe go back and just uh, briefly, uh, you know, help us with that and just go through PowerPoint the things that uh, you kind of like run over. Yeah, like now. While we're waiting for that, let me give you one hopeful note. There uh, is a genie in my uh, head that uh, makes me look at a lot of uh, peculiar and interesting things. I see, think I was born with this, so it's a congenital defect of sorts. And uh, about 10 years ago, I got wondering if there was anything better than avoidance of further exposure. Is there a treatment? Can you intervene? Can anything be done? And I, I'm happy again to report our impression from about 50 people of various kinds of chemical damage, that about 20 of them with hydrogen sulfide, that hydrogen sulfide is one of those exposures most susceptible to intervention and even reverse it. So I have some patients who are literally using walkers to get around, their balance is so bad, who are back working full time. And I get calls from them, the last call came from Bangkok, Thailand, from a man who for 25 years of putting bunker fuel into ships, the ships that you know, traverse between uh, Los Angeles and China to get products for Walmart and other sales. And uh, he said, you know, it's just wonderful. I got away from uh, all my exposures. I took the drug, which is called MS Luminol. And uh, I said, I can tell you're better. You're so cheerful and so forth and so on. I've got about six patients now who have graduated from treatment. In other words, the brain has gotten so much better, squirts of the day treatment in my nose, it has to be given through the nose. Uh, and I equate that with, they must be a lot better. And we have them back to retest and find that in truth, they are better. So there is hope in all this. Now, I've got a question back when he was talking about converting hydrogen and sulfur dioxide to hydrogen. Um, so, uh, H2S, if it was converting to H2S, we can smell it. That, I mean, if you're exposed to H2S, you can smell it as a rotten egg smell? You can until your nose quits being able to smell. Right. So, quits because I guess it's worn out. <laughs> I guess basically the question is, if, if, it, if there was large amounts of hydrogen sulfide being emitted to the atmosphere from, say, the volcano, we would smell hydrogen sulfide if it was being emitted, basically, uh, like around the island in different places. Well, if it's around 30 parts per billion, well, you would be able to smell it because you're not knocking your nose out. But if your, your nose has quit being able to recognize it because of 
really cellular uh, exhaustion, then you won't smell. Right, but I I that's don't, when I'm driving around the island, I don't smell rot mix all over the place. So hmm. that's my, I just want that's, to that's hopeful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What? I think we don't necessarily hear tourists complain, and they hopefully aren't having damage not broken yet. What's tourists complain? We don't hear tourists complain, so. Uh, well, <laughs> I was among some of the tourists, and they seem to be so gung ho to see the volcano, and I don't think they're paying much attention to whether their clumsiness is caused by what they're smelling from the volcano. Uh, what I find is that denial is a human attribute. I'm sure there are one or two people in the audience who aren't deniers, but probably the rest of us are. So uh, it's hard to gauge from talking with tourists. And I don't think this is racial slur. Most of them are Japanese, and I wouldn't have been able to recognize in their enthusiasm for what they were seeing, taking pictures of, you know, if they were blind, deaf, or dumb. Yes? How would you be able, how would you feel about well serving here with, with our volcano here, releasing H2S as well as our geothermal bath? How can you do surveys when you have it releasing from both places? What is your plan? Like, if you were to do these surveys here, how long would it take, and how would you test it? Test here, and who would be the comparison test group so that you can prove that these things are happening here with the poison? Well, that's a, a full menu of uh, what we should proceed with. We're going to start with uh, uh, Laura Travis and people she nominates as helpers. Get some questionnaires that we pre tested around. Uh, do some measurements, the same measurements you showed up here, and begin to collect some real numbers, some data. Uh, with those numbers, we'll then try to make sorts on you know, where the people who did the testing live, and on a map, try to plot something that makes some sense for the geothermal plant and the uh, volcano. We may not be able to separate the effects. So, you know, then it behooves us to ask the government to close down the volcano and the state government to close down geothermal. Um, it's a bit facetious, but distance is the best protection. And remember downhill versus uphill our uphill versus downhill. I think getting more information is critical to making good decisions. And I can't anticipate what all of those decisions may be. But I would encourage you to uh, hear Laura, uh, go through some of the testing like we've demonstrated and shown the pictures, and uh, become a member of Let's solve this problem on our own before uh, you know, Dr. Adler and uh, what's that other doctor's name, Thomas, uh, put too many more uh, sociologists' uh, predictions of good health into the stew, which is really a medical toxicological stew. I don't really think they have anything to contribute. Yes? It's my understanding that the uh, sulfides that are released from the volcano roll down, or I mean, sorry, I do sulfides from the top of the volcano, release in the air, roll down, and get oxidized. In order to convert it back in H2S, you'd have to have anaerobic reducing conditions. So, very second, I think. So, water. I think the whole sulfide argument is just wrong. Well, water. <laughs> All you need is a source of a lot of hydrogen and you've got your reducing conditions. So it, uh, we, we've studied this enough in places like Dakota City to know that uh, you know, sulfide 
in this case, refines a fight used to take the hair off a hide, uh, is enriching the pollen, which is like an ocean, uh, and the uh, bubbles of hydrogen sulfide come out of that. Uh, all the conditions uh, are hard to anticipate. Only study will show that uh, there is absolutely no doubt chemically that you can produce hydrogen sulfide from SO2 in the abundance of water and under conditions where electrons are likely to be moving. And in fact, the ocean could be on, it could be uh, you know, that little uh, collection of water by Belmont School. Well, the tests are not uh, capable of distinguishing between chemicals that affect the brain. Fluorine, for example, is known to be in the volcanic, probably known to be in what uh, you know, the geothermal plant produces. I mean, the source is still volcano. In one case, it's Volcano coming through and being pumped as brine uh, to uh, turn generators to make electricity. Uh, I just, it's hard to uh, make predictions beyond or to propose a way to make separation. And when I was talking with my colleague at the University of Santa Barbara, Dr. Hitler said, uh, we can do that with isotopes. The volcano is going to have uh, a different radon concentration. Everybody know what I'm talking about? There's radon in the volcano. There's radon in the geothermal. It's possible that at different levels in the Earth being tapped, that the radon concentration or the radon fingerprint is a different. That all is research and fundamental physical chemistry. And, you know, it just uh, it has to be sorted out. Um, it can be done, but it's quite expensive to do. And I don't think we should uh, have children breathing hydrogen sulfide any source all the way to find out who's really responsible how to shut it down. Let's get them away from it. Oh, yeah, the oh, yeah, the Well, I was going to bring him up to the...